Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. Every good action movie has its fair share of expendable cannon fodder. After all, all those bullets, magical arrows, and explosions have to hit someone, right? I mean, y you could use fuzzy, cute animals, but some might argue that would be in poor taste. So today we're going to list our top 10 cannon fodder in films, because at the end of the day, if someone has to die, might as well be an organized effort. There's nothing Americans love more than seeing redcoats get slaughtered in wholesale. You guys did burn down the White House, after all. In Pirates of the Caribbean Curse of the Black Pearl, Captain Barbossa and his undead pirates spend half the movie blowing up, shooting, and slitting the throats of British soldiers and sailors. And it's a one-sided affair because you can't really kill what's already dead, which is actually pretty terrifying for a Disney movie. I guess red is a popular color to die in. It's the color of passion, fire, and blood. Tons of blood spilling out of the bodies of cannon fodder. Which was constantly happening to the red shirts from Star Trek. A combination of terrible production, lazy stunt coronation, and a sci-fi setting makes the red shirts' numerous deaths in the earlier Star Trek series all that more memorable. And while their deaths lacked in quality, it more than made up for it with quantity. And to make matters even worse, most of the time when the red shirts died, their bodies usually just disappeared. Which means no open casket funeral. We talked about Star Trek, so now let's move on to Star Wars. Star Wars is full of cannon fodder. After all, this franchise does have the word wars in it. But I'm going to limit this video to just two types, starting off with the Stormtroopers. They really do have it rough. Most of these guys and gals are just looking for some honest work in a galaxy that has been hit by a major recession because some idiot forgot to insure the government's planet-sized peacekeeping station. Despite their good intentions, Stormtroopers are constantly getting shot, bludgeoned, blown up, dismembered, and even eaten. Not only have they died in the most creative and numerous ways, they've also probably died in the largest numbers as well. After all, every time one of these Star Destroyers blow up, there's about 9,000 Stormtroopers stationed aboard. And then there's Death Star 1 and Death Star 2, which probably adds a few more hundreds of thousands of deaths to the count. So that was the original trilogy, what about the prequels? We could talk about the clones, a lot of them died thanks to their stupid Jedi General's battle tactics, but it's really the B-1 battle droids that stand out the most. They basically are the definition of cannon fodder, and better yet, we don't have to feel bad about making fun of them because robots don't have souls. Can the blue fairy make a robot into a real live boy? That's right, you'll never be a real boy. During the Battle of Naboo, thousands of battle droids were deactivated at once, and even when they figured out how to decentralize their control system, they still died in huge numbers all across the galaxy. Add an extremely annoying personality and voice to them, and you have the perfect mass-produced cannon fodder. Next up is the B-1 battle droid of ancient Greece, the Persian Light Infantry. 300 Spartans were pretty badass, but without an enemy to slaughter in massive numbers, they would just be a bunch of oiled up guys in leather thongs that occasionally molest young boys. But because of the Persians, they were able to mount one of the most epic and heroic defenses the world has ever seen. These poor bastards were wrapped up in level 1 cloth armor and carrying shields they probably stole from Pottery Barn and just running into the spears of Spartans in slow motion. But just because you're properly armored and trained doesn't necessarily mean you're going to survive. The Gondorians of Middle-earth surely look the part of a badass soldier, but as anyone who's played Warcraft 2 can attest, an orc will always beat a foot soldier in single combat. It's not specious, it's genetics. Now in Lord of the Rings, some of the orcs are smaller than humans, but let's not forget about the Nazgûls and the giant trolls and all the other horrible things that inhabit Middle-earth. You would think having so many crazy monsters to fight, the Gondorians would invent something useful. Like, I don't know, a gun? Why the hell would you try to melee battle something like this? Especially if you're not a named character. That just sets you up for a death that will most likely require a heavy dose of CGI and stir up film sensors. But then again, guns don't work on everything. The bugs from Starship Trooper are essentially bullet sponges you would expect in a lazy game that just increases the hit points of your opponents to make the game harder. Sure, the Starship Troopers are citizens and get the vote because of their service, but seriously, how many people would actually want to serve on the front lines of this crazy war? I, for one, am terrified of bugs. Do you have any idea how powerful they are considering how much they weigh? An ant can lift 20 to 100 times their own weight. Now imagine that kind of strength in a bug the size of a car. To make up for humans' naturally fragile bodies, 
Exoskeletons are sometimes employed in sci-fi films to even the playing field. But even with these mobile suits, the humans in Edge of Tomorrow don't really stand much of a chance against the alien onslaught. I mean, Tom Cruise alone dies a few dozen times, and that's with the protection of Scientology wrapped around him. How much of a chance do you think everyone else has? As you probably know by now, Tom Cruise does not play a role, he is the role. And before he was a badass running around in an exoskeleton suit slaughtering aliens, he was commanding a very poorly trained unit of Japanese conscripts. Most of these peasants had never seen a firearm prior to training, and many of them weren't eager to fight at all. To make it worse, they were going up against the ruthless samurai warrior class who traditionally ruled the peasants. There's nothing that says cannon fodder more than communist conscripts. One man has a rifle to follow him with bullets and wait for him to die. And should you think about going backwards, there's an officer with a submachine gun ready to shoot you. But in the end, humans are too individualistic to create such a society. But ants, well, they have that hive mind group think mentality perfected. And despite being a kid's cartoon, there are plenty of adult messages and brutal battles in which literally thousands of ants die. Sure, it might not be that bad from a human point of view, but seeing a battle against giant termites from the point of view of an ant was terrifying. Cannon fodder is a cheap way of creating emotions and creating sacrifice. You could kill that one extremely well-developed character that everyone loves, or you could sacrifice millions of faceless soldiers. But in the end, Han Solo's death will always be more impactful than the dozens or so rebels Darth Vader kills at the end of Rogue One. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button. My name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.